Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, May 18th, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every, every week, he tried to say. Actually, this week I didn't think I'd have that much, and I started putting everything together. And once again, um, I said earlier I would start on time, but I had more info to add at the last minute, so as usual, a lot of stuff to cover. So we'll go ahead and get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Maybe some Mountain Dew did not compensate me for this free endorsement. This one's a little icy. Cool. But PepsiCo, if you're out there, give me a shout out. Or uh, who else would be out there? Red Bull? No, Red Bull saw it was too fat. Well, I concentrated it with the with the ice. All righty then. All right, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. And I like to sum it up by saying all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now. And then, hey, this is part of the show where I beg for a review. Sometimes we have more people here than there are reviews on Amazon. So I know somebody's holding out on me. So if you get a chance, put me up a review on Amazon.com, even if it's um, I agree with the other people. Because, um, like I say each week, or most every week, there are some malignant people out there who review the reviews, which makes no sense to me in the world. I can't imagine having that much idle time that you can go on Amazon.com and review reviews. But uh, some people are malignant. So anyway, do me a favor, throw me a bone. This is the link that will bring you to Amazon for that. And I will give you a high five if you uh, if you um, give me a good review. Look. All right, what did we talk about? Well, when I was looking at last week's slides, I realized that I probably should go ahead and follow up on this uh, nuance of volatility, one of the nuances at least, the, the fake-out breakout characteristic. And that's kind of playing out pretty cool. And somebody asked me last week, last week it's like, why do we need to know about volatility? Well, it helps, and it, it, it's all part of what helps you to understand the market. And knowing that out of a low volatility situation, you get a fake out first. For me, I know not to freak out. Years ago, if I was long and the market was dropping in volatility, I probably wouldn't even know it was dropping in volatility. But I see a sell-off, I would think, oh, goodness, here we go again. But this time, it was like, well... It's out of a low volatility situation. Let's just wait and see. Maybe it's just a fake out before the real move. So we'll take a look at that. Uh, we have a better than poke in the eye example this week, and, and that's always a good thing. And uh, I'll flesh that out in just one second. My pen stopped working. Talk amongst yourselves. I can't, I can't operate without a pen. Oh, well. Um, what else is happening here? Let's see. That's a bummer. Here we go. Come on. You can, you can do it. All right. Start working again. Uh, again, we'll talk about the better the poke of the eye trade. That'll make a lot more sense in just a few minutes. Uh, sometimes you only get the initial profit tour. You get stopped out. So what? Okay. Uh, I have another dead money report this week. And, again, that'll make some sense. A couple of random thoughts. Um, thoughts on your subject. Start thinking about them now. Um, Hold off on your individual stock picks for now, but if there's anything you want me to cover, or if you have any questions, anything that I cover over the next few minutes, please let me know. And that, that sometimes helps to draw me out and, and um, puts me on tangents and all. Somebody once said, I always feel like I rambled, and my wife would ask me after the show, how'd you do? And I said, like, eh, I rambled a lot. I think I brought it back together, but I don't know. And... Um, I no longer say that because somebody once said, hey, Dave, when you're off on those tangents, I learn more than when you're trying to directly teach me. So feel free to ask questions and draw me out on some of these subjects because that's when um, sometimes the real lesson comes. Better than poking the eye. Better than poking the eye trade is when you get that initial profit target, it comes back in and stops out. The money management system is designed to where you're looking to take partial profits and it's actually half at initial profit target, and then you bump that stop up to break even. So if it's a trailing stop, you bring it up to break even like this. And the idea is hopefully it doesn't come back and stop you out. Hopefully it takes off again. As I say ad nauseum, if we have one, two, let's say three of those trades in a row, 
Somebody will email me and say, hey, Dave, why don't we take 100% profit here? And the answer is, longer term, this is not going to test out or work out as a money management system. It, it will probably have a negative expectancy. And I did a whole webinar just on that. So if you get the webinar archives, you'll have that. Uh, actually, I actually did two webinars on that. So watch those. And uh, conversely, when the market is doing this, just take it off, trade after trade after trade. People say, hey, Dave, why don't we keep 100%? Well, we don't know that it might turn around and do just this. So it's important to capture the longer-term trends. But if you get enough poke-in-the-eye trades, better than poke-in-the-eye trades, I should say, then you're not going to set the world on fire, but it helps to keep your head above the water. It helps to put a little money in your account. helps to keep the electricity on. So it's it's a good thing. Any questions on better than poke in the eye? The um, and if you look at the gain from here to here over the period of time, I didn't annualize it. I think we did it a few weeks back. But annualize that's a pretty good trade. So speaking of annualizing trades, this brings us to our next subject: the dead money report which is brought to you this week by www.trendfollowingmoron.com. I would say go there now, but we're in the middle of a webinar. Check it out after the webinar. I think you're going to really like what you find there. It's going to be it's pretty awesome. Anyway, uh, I've given this definition time and time again. Dead money is slang term for money invested in security with minor hopes of appreciation or earning return. And... That would be great if you do something that was truly dead money, but you don't. So if you knew something would never materialize, then by all means, get out of it, okay? But you don't. So what do you do? Well, you stop. And if it doesn't materialize, you get stopped out. If it does, then you're in for the ride. And all you need is a few big winners, and I'll, I'll rehash that in just, just a few seconds, but just a few big winners can make all the difference in the world. And if you micromanage yourself out of trades by saying, yeah, I don't know why I'm sounding like Lucy, but I mean, like, well, it's not really doing anything. Markets make it do highs. Stocks just sit there. It's a dog. And you mic yourself out of you. So you get out. So what happens? Of course, the next day or day after, the stock takes off without you. One of my, there's actually a couple, two of my favorite examples. One was on the short side, and it went up for like two days, like right after we entered it. It went up for like two days. didn't really cream us or anything, but it was negative for like the first two days. And I got an email or two from people saying, hey, Dave, market's going down. This stock's going up. It's defying gravity. This is a sign for me to get out. I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'm just going to follow my plan because I'm not that smart. And lo and behold, what happened? Well, the stock imploded overnight, losing half of its value, literally half of its value. And that's a short, so that's a good thing, FYI. Another case which really sticks out in my mind was a buyout where the stock triggered it, went absolutely flat for a month, didn't do anything wrong, didn't do anything right. It was kind of teetering between profitability and not. Uh, depends on which way the wind was blowing on whatever day in between. But then after about a month of sideways action, the stock had bought out and went up about 100%. Now, I was glad it happened. Ideally, though, if I get in a position, I feel like if it gets bought out, that limits my gains. I'd like to see it go even more than 100%, which is about what you normally get on a buyout. But I'm not going to complain. So the point is, stick with your positions. And Realize that the market is not always going to move in your favor. Let's take a look at this RAD in here. And RAD is a, was a short. Let's see if I can make this come up here. RAD was a short right around here. And initially, boy, it looked like it was going to do great. And what happened the next day? Nothing. Went right back up. And then meandered around. So what do we do? That's about, let's see, that's about a month's worth of trading. Nothing. We just sit in that dead money position. So what? Okay. And then look what happened. Well, it went down, hit the profit target. And then of course it just flatlined again. So again, that's dead money. Well, I should get out. That's all I'm going to get. Well, truth be told, even I was thinking, geez, is this thing ever going to move? Why are we sticking with it? And then luckily, 
Luckily, this is a sound kind of vain, but luckily I have Dave Landry here 100% of the time to consult with. Now, before you say, oh, you, you're so egotistical, Dave, before you say anything, my wife walked in my office once, and she says, what's going on? I said, she goes, you look a little stressed out, and it was good stress. I said, oh, I got all this stuff going on, and the stuff's really working, but I'm not sure what to do. And she looked at me, and she said, well, what would Dave Landry do? And I'm like, oh, and it's like, that's one positive thing sometimes about being married is that uh, you get a little reality check every now and then. It's like, oh, okay, well, Dave Landry would do this. He would trail that stop higher. He would stay with that position. He would resist that temptation to take that profit and let it ride. So your life gets a lot easier once you have a plan in place and once you follow that plan. And following that plan, as I preach week after week after week, is important and once you learn how to do that you're not going to get rich overnight but you're going to be fine longer term i was watching something yesterday it was amazing uh some guy was selling a system and he said that um you could you could make five hundred thousand dollars and then you could take that five hundred thousand dollars and make a six-figure income off that five hundred thousand dollars and then you could do that three times in a row and i'm like well, shoot if i could just if if i could if I could run, uh, and it was like a $10,000 investment or something, something ridiculous, maybe even smaller than that. So if I could turn 10 into 500 and that 500 into a steady income, six-figure income, then I would do that all day long, and I would have, oh, I don't know, let's say 100, 500K accounts. He even said that at some point you would be so wealthy you could actually be moving the markets. Now, I can't promise you that you'll be moving the markets Although maybe someday you might. Who knows? It could happen, right? But I can promise you if you follow the system longer term, just general trend following 101, stick to the plan, stick with the rules. You're not going to make money every day. You're not going to make money every month. You might even go a year without making much, okay? But longer term, you'll do just fine, especially when those trends begin to hit. And as long as you can follow your plan. And again, I make it sound a little too elusive. But somehow they magically just come along, okay? As long as you capture a few outliers here and there, a few of those big gainers, then your entire year is going to be made. In the meantime, you just kind of grind it out. You do end up with a few of these better than the poke in the eye trades. You do end up sitting on some of this dead money for a while. And unfortunately, and I'm one of the few guys out there that admit it, but you will have some losses, okay? And get over it. And I... I probably spent too much time tempering everybody's expectations about the fact that you will have losses. But you will. But if you can have a plan, which includes a money and position, he tried to say, management plan in place, and more importantly, if you could follow that plan, then you do fine longer term. Now, let's take a look at this one. Riding the trend with Zen. The reason I want to show you this one is because, well, there was actually two entries here. There was one entry here, and it came, and it kind of nicked out of the stop, although I recommended staying with it. Mechanically, it did stop out. And the second entry, I said, well, this looks pretty good. It wasn't exactly a perfect pullback setup, but it is an IPO, and sometimes you can be a little more lenient with them. The second entry was right there. And you can see we got a pretty good run out of this, okay? And it just kind of topped out right around this 27-ish level. And then look what happened. It began to pull back. So those are open profits that are evaporating. So what do you do? Well, you don't do anything because we already took partial profits, okay? And we have our stop moved up to where even if we get stopped out, we're still going to have a profit. It's not as big as uh, we may want. My pen is acting up today. You saw it just ran across the top of the screen. I wonder what's going on. I love my pen. It's okay. I have a spare one in storage. I have to grab it if it messes up. But the point is, you already got your partial profits. And even if you get stopped out, you still make a profit on the remainder. Now, I'm not going to go into too much details on this, but one thing that I recommend is don't monetize profits. Don't look at it right here and say, I could buy this or I could buy that at that particular level. Okay? 
do honor your stop. And if you get stopped out, so what? And if it's you get stopped out and you run from here to here, well, I'm sorry, here to here, it's better than poke in the eye, okay? But if you survive, if you're able to survive that that test, that drawdown, that pullback, whatever you want to call that, and this thing goes on to make new highs, then you might just have a home run on your hands, and you might just end up making a whole lot of money. As I've showed, I've showed many of these charts before, but one comes to mind. It's when um, I showed a chart where it's up about 50%. I think it was like 44%. It comes back down, and you're up about 25%. And then it goes back up, and you're up like 75%. Then it comes back down, you're down 50, you're up 50%. And it goes on to 200% plus, and then it stops out at like 150%. Well, as I say quite often, if you quit at 50, you're never going to get 75. You quit at 75, you're never going to get 200%. You quit at 200%, you're never going to get 400%. You quit at 400%, you're never going to get 800% on a trade. Not that it happens that often, but if you quit, it will never happen, okay? So that's trailing stops. I'd be willing to give up some open profits. Any questions on that before we move on? I can get to the question window. My question window ran away. Oh, here it is. What about swing trading half the position within the trending stock? Well, what I will recommend on occasion is swing trading around a position. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking, but let's – uh. Let me show you that real quick. Okay, Paul is asking this, why not swing trade around? And the answer is, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, let's uh let's use the let's use 200 shares to keep the math easy, okay? Let's say you put on 200 shares here and you flip out this is plus 200 and then minus 200 here. I'm sorry, minus 100. Okay, so net net, you still have a hundred shares on. Let's say it pulls back. Well, then you put back on one hundred shares. Okay, let me start over. Oops, talk amongst yourselves. We'll edit that out. Okay, Paul saying, why not swing trade around a position? Absolutely. Okay, let's say you put on a position here, put on two hundred shares. Okay, flip out a hundred here. That's minus one hundred equals 100 left, okay? And then you get a little pullback here, and then it get, begins to take off. Then put on another 100, okay? And then it takes off, and then oh, take off 100, okay? That's swing trading around a core position. Now, in a trading service, I don't come in and say, okay, guys, let's swing trade around a core position. I just let things shake out, and then I might actually go in and swing trade around it, but I'll also tell the peeps, my peeps, hey, guess what? This has a potential. For instance, Zen... Let me go back. Let me see if I, I'm having pointer issues today. Well, anyway, it's a laser pointer now. I can't fix that. But Zen, right around this area here, was set up again. Now, I didn't say go on and put in, put on another half of the position because I don't want to track that, and I don't want to have to go through all of that uh, ordeal. But the service would probably do a lot better if I did. But the reason I do is I just want to keep it simple because that's going to be confusing for a lot of people, especially newer people, if I'm saying, okay, you want to put some more shares on here, but you're just going to do half the size, and you're going to flip out some shares here. It's going to get pretty complicated pretty quickly. So what I do instead is I just let everybody know, hey, guys, it's set up again. And if people ask me, oh, yeah, an entry would probably be right around here. It would be a good entry on that. And then use um, the certain amount of points to flip things out. Just use common sense and, and figure out, okay, well, let's see how far that stop is away. So, yeah, you can certainly swing trade around a position. And that's a way to squeak out a little bit more gains out of a position. Okay, Robert says, hey, Robert, what about stocks that are not IPOs or microcap stocks under $10? Okay. Uh, let's see if I can read this. What if you just swing traded mid large cap stocks with good setups? What about stocks that are not? What if you just swing traded mid cap large stocks with good setups? Should stocks approach be different because you're not likely to get 200% or higher profits? Well, I hear what you're saying. 
Uh, he's saying, what if you're trading like a mid-cap or something? Should your approach be different because you're not going to get those higher profits? Well, let's let's just take a look at something. Um, the answer is no. You want to do the same thing, okay? And let's we get a chart over here. I got a hidden window. Let me see if I can find a good example. The answer is no. And the reason is because take a look at something like Micro, it just comes to mind. Okay? Let's say you were trading this on the upside. Well, in 2013, where was Micron? It was at five dollars a share. Okay, that's a that's a big cap stock or a mid cap stock, however you want to look at it. Where was it not too long ago? Thirty something dollars a share. So it went up what? Five hundred percent? Okay. So even if you are trading a bigger cap stock which has less potential, then I still think you need to position yourself for unlimited gains. Now, let me take that one step further. What's going on in the REITs right now? We're going to take a look at them in just one second. So if you don't know, you'll see it. The REITs are imploding. Now, these REITs are sleepy little real estate stocks that never move around much. But all of a sudden, bam, they're just absolutely imploding. The, the volatility has absolutely exploded in these REITs because bonds are beginning to implode. So that's the danger of trading a less volatility market, which in, which in general is going to come with the higher and higher cap stocks that you're trading. But you got to keep in mind that something bad could still always happen, okay? Now, if that's what you do, it's not by way of the highway, okay? If you want to swing trade these big stocks and flip in and out of them, then I think that's fine. And I think if, if you could do that and you make that your focus, then that's fine. However, I think you'd be better off if you traded setups, whether it be small cap, mid cap, large cap, whatever, but ideally a little bit smaller than mid cap in general. That's a general statement. But trade at those issues and be willing to take partial profits, take that swing trade, but then hang on to a piece just in case it takes off. Okay, Micron, biggest chip manufacturer of what, memory chips or whatever in the world, I'm guessing. I don't know. It used to be at least. It used to be the only game in town. And it went up 500%, and it trades a bazillion shares a day. What is that? Zero, zero, 28 million. Okay, it was traded 28 million shares back when it was in this five, around five bucks a share. Okay. So, no, uh, should your stops approach be different? Your stops are going to be different. Okay. Your stops are going to rec represent the volatility of the market. The only problem with that is, as I was saying earlier, is something bad can still happen. So what's going to happen is if, let's say, you, let's say you got an entry here on just a random stock. If that stock is volatile, your stop might be right here, okay? If it's not that volatile, your stop may be right here, okay? Which trade has more risk? Well, Dave, it goes all the way down here. You lose 10 points. Now, I'd say that trade has more risk. Well, actually, in reality, I think this trade has more risk, okay? Say this is one point, say this is 10 points, okay? Well, to get your money management right, if you're trading, let's say, 2% or 1%, it doesn't matter, whatever, small, some small percentage of your account, if stopped out, you're going to buy 10 times the amount of this stock that you would of this stock. You're going to buy one-tenth the amount of this stock, okay? So if something bad happens in this one, so what? you've got one-tenth of the position that you have in this one. If something bad happens in this one, guess what? You're going to be in a lot of trouble, okay? I've always said, or I often bring up, I should say, the the the, the example of um, a friend of mine. I, sometimes I say his name, sometimes I don't. So I'm not sure whether I'm supposed to say it or not. But uh, a friend of mine was running a hedge fund, and they got a signal to buy like T-bills or something like that. And 
I don't know exactly how much they had in their hedge fund, but based on the volatility of T-bills, they were supposed to buy like $2 billion worth of T-bills, and their fund was, was, was much smaller than that. Let's say it was $100 million or something, but trust me, it was much smaller than, than $2 billion, but still sizable. And he, he did not take that trade. He, well, he took it, but he adjusted it down because even in something like T-bills, they still could make a move, and that move could be large enough to wipe out their entire fund. So when he saw the system say, buy T-bills and we need to buy a couple of billion dollars worth of them, he's like, whoa, 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 okay? Let's not get that leveraged into these T-bills just in case something bad happens uh, that could wipe us out, okay? So with a lower volatility market, you're going to need bigger and bigger and bigger positions. Now, I use an extreme example of a one-point stop and a ten-point stop. But trust me, in order to get the money management right, this position has to be 10 times the size of this position. So I'm writing a chapter called Volatility Better, Better the Devil You Know. And I would rather trade a volatile stock, knowing that's going to be volatile, knowing the nature of the beast, than to trade a non-volatile stock and then have it turn volatile on the overnight. Now, there is one caveat to that. We're short that MU. It's not that volatile, and it's a huge cap stock, okay? And the reason that I'm willing to short something lower in volatility or a more efficient stock, however you want to look at it, is because I'm looking for that volatility to increase. So I would much rather short it, short a lower volatility stock than, go, than try to go log one and then have something bad happen overnight. And that's sort of the premise or part of the premise of what I call my go-go no mo strategy, which is kind of a silly name, but um, if you if you break it down, it's go-go meaning like a momentum stock, no mo meaning like no more momentum in the stock. Read the uh, article; it's free on my website. All right, let's see. Dave, do you ever take partial profits? Hey, Mike, good to see you. So, second time the stock really goes nuts. Big gap on earnings and just sticks to the trading stop. Um, that happens. It, it doesn't happen that often, so it's fairly rare. But what Mike is saying is, let's say you get the mother of all windfalls. I've, I have lightened up a little bit in, on those situations, but I always hold on to a piece. Now, what I might do, and this is kind of, this is where some people get it. Mike, I know you. I know. I know who you are, and I know. I know you personally. I know you. You're a trader. And you could. You're a big boy. Um, but be careful for you other guys out there. If you're a little doer to trade, be careful with this. But sometimes, yes, I might lighten up a little bit. And what I'll do is fritter away a small portion of those proceeds on some sort of lottery ticket type of option. Notice I use the word lottery ticket, okay? So if this stock continues to implode or take off, whatever the case may be, for this windfall, then I still get to participate in those options, okay? And if it doesn't, then so what, okay? I just frittered away a small portion of the proceeds. So, yeah, you could lighten up, and you could also use options to keep you in that position should a huge move ensue, okay? So where's the stop for RAD now? I don't know, Phil. We'll, we'll see tonight. Uh, pull up tonight's service, okay? Hello, Dave. Patience with an entry means you can lower risk by waiting for an optimum entry or lower risk on the same stock, but easier said than done. Well, he's saying, what Howard is saying is that if you if you change your entry, you got your stop here. If you change your entry lower or higher, it changes the stop. And I agree with that, but you still got the volatility of the underlying market, and it's, it's all going to come out in the wash anyway between a lower volatility and a higher volatility stock. All right, Albert says, the wide stop also raises the profit target so it's less likely to reach the IPT. Not exactly, okay? He's saying that, well, wait a minute, Dave. If you got a wide stop, you also have a wide profit target. But it's all relative, okay? Um, I started to make a joke about that, but it's, I guess it's bad taste. <laughs> so he's saying that if you stop, as, let's say your entry's here, your stop is way down here, then your initial profit target is way up here, and it's harder to hit. 
No, it's all relative to the volatility of the stock, okay? If you have a low volatility stock, it's doing this. If you have a high volatility stock, it's doing this, okay? So um, IPT stop, IPT stop, okay? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's volatility. And this, you know, last week somebody goes, why do we have to know about volatility, okay? Well, I just answered that question right here. A volatile stock is more likely, well, it, it, it's the same, except that I'll take it one step further. This, this is what I'm trying to say. That volatile stock has been volatile, and it might even be more volatile, okay? In fact, if you if done properly, and you see me do quite a few presentations on this, if you get that set up properly, two things are going to happen. One, it's going to move in the direction of the trend, and two, volatility, let's say this is your volatility, volatility is going to expand too because you want to make as much money as fast as possible. So if you're trading a volatile stock and you've got a really good setup and you do it right, that volatility is going to expand even further, so the chances of it hitting that initial profit target are even better in a more volatile stock than they are in a less volatile stock. A less volatile stock is more efficient. And as soon as it starts to rally up a little bit, what's going to happen? Well, we just had some gentleman in here a minute ago. I forget your name. Uh, my apologies. Was talking about, hey, what if I just swing trade around these big cap stocks? Well, you got people doing that. It's an it's efficient market. They just bounce it around a little bit. People know, hey, for the most part, it's not going to go much higher than that. I'm just going to take my profits. So, yeah, if you're trading a lower volatility stock, which more likely is more likely to be less efficient and when, when it comes to efficiency and inefficiency, not to soft sell you, but I'll do it anyway, <laughs> go in and watch the stock selection course. We spent probably an hour on efficiency. And for me, it's not that exciting, but it's so important for you to understand inefficiency and efficiency when it comes to stocks. And that comes with volatility. It comes with volume. It comes with whether the stock is known or unknown. There's all these things that factor into that inefficiency. And inefficiency is really one of the keys to to success in this business. In fact, it's probably one of the most important things because we're trying to capture that inefficiency in a market. We're we're trying to get that little solo stock that's going to go up 500%. If it was efficient, it would have just bounced around within a couple of percent range and never really moves around. Oh, that's what it's worth. That's what it's worth. Okay? Instead, it's worth 500% higher the next year. But it's something efficient, eh, what it's worth might be what it's worth, okay? Seems too good to go for low volatility that will expand, i.e. tighter stop. Seems to good seems good to go for low volatility. To tight. Well, I hear you. He's saying use a tight stop at a low volatility market. Well, keep in mind that it still could it still could gap away from you overnight. And you still could be in a lot of trouble. So, yeah, a low volatility market can go away from you. Now, ideally, maybe you could combine volatility with price. And, uh, I, you know, I used to call them sleeping tigers. And um, somebody else claimed that same name at right around the same time. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to get into a, pardon my French, a pissing contest. But it was, but I coined the term and somebody else started using it. So I just stopped using it. But I used to call them sleeping tigers. And a sleeping tiger is a market that the longer term volatility is like way up here, okay? The shorter term volatility is like way down here, okay? So what's going to happen? Well, when that market wakes up, you could end up with a tiger by your tail, okay? Meaning that it's going to revert back to its mean, which is what we're getting ready to talk about here. In a, in a few uh, in a few minutes, okay. So sleep a tiger, you know, go go kick it in the butt. What's going to happen? It's going to wake up. So with something, whatever that catalyst is that wakes up that sleep and sleep a tiger, it's going to take off. So yeah, if you're going to incorporate volatility into your trades, maybe maybe go for that sleep a tiger, and wait for that volatility to to really decrease, and then look for an expansion of that volatility. Get on as that volatility expands. And maybe, as I'm going to show you here in just one second, maybe you wait for that first false move to be a, 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 a fake-out one. 
Um, anybody, anybody here who remembers the late 90s, they didn't properly adjust for volatility. And this was especially true in the options market. And that's why I was such a big fan of volatility because they couldn't get it right in the options market. I mean, who, who would have thought that the market is going to go up a bazillion percent and just go up every day? I mean, I talk about this example all the time. It just blows me away. I had a stock. I think it was Redneck Networks. Redback Networks is what they call it. We call it Redneck Networks back then. It was in my column, like was 50-something dollars a share. Triggered, kind of bounced around within that level, within an eighth. We were trading eighths back then. And then by the end of the day, it went up 50-something points. It doubled overnight. No one could have ever predicted. I mean, I thought it was going to go higher. I thought it might have made a swing trade. I thought it was worth a swing trade. But there was no way in the world that I knew, or anyone else knew for that matter, that it was going to go up 100% in one day. So they failed to calculate fully for volatility back in the day. Now, where am I going with this? Well, back in the day, I paid attention to a lot of these sleeping tigers, especially if they were set up, and I played options off of them. And you could absolutely print money doing that, but that was back in the day. I know I digress, and I'm fantasizing about those old days. That was then. This is now. But just to understand, if you're going to incorporate volatility, Learn a little bit about the sleeping tigers, which is low volatility, uh, in a very high volatility type of situation. And look for that volatility to expand. Now, uh, as I said last week, volatility tends to be cyclical. And one of the nuances is that when you reach like an extreme, it tends to fly back into the extreme other direction. Okay, um, So the sine wave is probably not... Representative, truly representative, it's probably more like this is what volatility actually does, okay? It tends to overshoot itself. So you can see back here, this is the 650 HV. I think it's a 650. Might be, yeah, it's 650. This is a six-day historical volatility. This is a 50-day historical volatility. It's also known as statistical volatility for those who are keeping score. And it's exactly that. It does keep score. It looks at the day-to-day -day change okay, in prices. And you'll notice that the day-over-day -day change in prices, I'm just putting a tick mark on the closes here. Okay. Oops. Wasn't a whole lot. So what happened? Volatility began to drop off. And to a point where it reaches a point where it's just so stretched to the downside. It's like a rubber, ba rubber band. What happens? And then the rubber band sort of expands, and then it pops to the upside. And then a lot of times it actually overshoots to the upside, okay, Once when this condition occurs. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because I've observed this low volatility situation just by eyeballing the chart, drawing some simple little – Trend lines connecting the highs. I'm sorry, connecting the closes. And then we begin to drop off out of it. Well, sometimes that first move in a volatility situation, when that volatility begins to increase, is a false one. And if all you did was wait for that false move and then trade the other way when it took out the high or it triggered an entry on the long side, whatever trigger you may be using, it will actually test out longer term. Not that I'm a big fan of mechanical testing, but these are good things to know to help you time the market. And it's kind of the same theory with what the NASDAQ just did. We'll take a look at it in just one second. But the NASDAQ chopped around in a range, and what happened? It broke down out of that range. Well, you don't want to take this signal, but take the breakout after a fake out of the bottom of the range, and usually that is the true move out, okay? On S&P HV example, why did volatility take off and dipped to 1900s on a rally up to 2000? Well, okay, you got to remember that volatility is a measurement of order, and that's where a lot of people get confused. They see volatility as uh, they they confuse volatility and price movement. Now. There are some nuances of price movement that make volatility change, okay? But you can see that volatility shot up 
Well, when did it shoot up? Well, the market began to implode. Look at this day here. And this is going from a close right around here to a close right around here. Let's look at that range, okay? Now, let's just, let's just kind of, in your mind's eye, bring that range over. That's one day range, okay? So let me see if I can draw it about the same size, which is a way to measure it. Let's see, can I use a finger or something to measure it? I don't know. Let's just, just for argument's sake, let's just say that this bracket is the same as this bracket, roughly the same, okay? So you've got a whole month's worth of trading within this bracket here, okay? And you got a whole day's worth of trading, or two days worth of trading, I guess, in this case, within this bracket here, okay? So volatility shot up because it's measuring day-over-day -day price changes, okay? These, here are your closes, okay? If the distance between close over close increases, volatility increases. Now, keep in mind, it's measuring order of a market and not necessarily price. One of the nuances is everybody runs to the door at the same time. They slide faster than they glide. So when you have an ultra-high volatility situation, increase in volatility, a spike in volatility, you might be close to a market low. I don't have it plotted, and I haven't plotted it lately, but go back to 2009 when they were throwing the baby out with the bathwater, market was imploded. As a trend follower, I was still short, and I stayed short, and I didn't try to call a bottom or anything, try to be a hero and go on CNBC or Bloomberg, whatever the case may be, and call a bottom. I just followed along. But I knew when I saw the extreme volatility that, eh, we might be getting close because – when everybody, when everybody rushes to the door, it's it's time to uh, you're close to a bottom. It's and like Walter Deemer once said. He's a he's a famous market technician. He said, uh, "When it's time to buy, you won't want to." Meaning that it's just the market just looks it's worse. But that's when you normally have a bottom shortly thereafter. That's when that volatility is just extreme. And then when it's time, he also said as a corollary, I think that's a corollary. Um, when it's time to sell, you won't want to. It'll feel too good because the market's just going up day after day. Now, one of the nuances of volatility is that, again, they slide faster than they glide. So you'll notice that this market started working its way higher, okay? And these are closes. Okay, so as it gets orderly and working its way higher, the day-over-day -day change wasn't that much, but it was also in a directional type of move. And, but it was nice and orderly in its direction and persisted. So what happens if volatility begins to drop? As I've said time and time again, with as volatility drops, I'm sorry, as persistency begins to increase, volatility will begin to drop. So and that's that's the big conversation we had last week. Can you use volatility to predict persistency? Maybe. But if you want to predict persistency, just eyeball a chart and draw the line through as many bars as possible. If you have to, then use linear regression. Use a linear regression trend line, okay? But for the rest of us, let's just keep it simple and draw a trend line through as many bars as possible. I can go for a mini bar right now. Looks like volatility only rises during crashes. Not true. Not true, not true Jonathan. I did, um, you know, this, this is where... This is where, and, you know, let me put on my soft sell hat again. This is where if you have the library of the flash drives. By the way, I found a lost, I lost, I found a lost library, 2011. I thought I only had a couple of flashes. For, I'm sorry, a couple of shows for that year. I found the entire year. Client asked me for them and, uh, and, and offered me uh, an offer. I couldn't refuse to put them together. So I'm going to, I'm going to put that up for those who want them to um, but the point is if you have a library of these shows you're going to see where we get into things like persistency and volatility and also the fact that if done properly volatility and the trend expands and those are both to the upside okay you start getting wide range bars to the upside just like you're getting wide range bars to the downside here which is causing a spike in volatility, you will get wide range bars to the upside, which will cause a spike in volatility. Take a look at like Zen, okay? Well, 
volatility kind of dropped off here, wasn't doing anything. But I guarantee you, when we finally got it right and, the, and this trend began to expand, the volatility began to shoot up, okay, when those wide range bars began to occur, even though it was to the upside. As a general statement, yes, volatility will increase as price begins to implode, as a general statement. But keep in mind, and this is where it, it, it trips up a lot of people, there's no definite direction in volatility. It's just, it's just a phenomenon that you are observing in the market and that you are measuring in the market. And you could use that to your advantage as we're kind of taking a look at here, okay? Should have pinned Crouching Tiger, 10 billion name. I don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Phil's a 50-day, 200-day moving average fans. Talk about RAD at the 200-day moving average. We'll look at that one in a second. Should volatility be taken into the account with the 2% count calculation, i.e., don't have to max out for a low volatility stock? I'm not sure what you're asking. Should volatility be taken into, into account with the 2% calculation, i.e., don't have to max out for a low volatility stock? Well, it, 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 are you asking the example I used in the T-bills? If they had to put 2% of that portfolio um, based on the stop into the T-bills, they would have ended up with a $2 billion position, something along those lines. I don't, I don't, I'm sure there's a little bit more details to it than that. So I, I, I'm guessing what you're saying is if a stock requires a very tiny stop, STOP, and it says, okay, I need to trade 10,000 shares on this 100 grand account. Um, hmm, that's going to be 75% of my account. Maybe that's a bad idea. So if that's what you're asking, yes. But instead of doing that, why not go find a more volatile stock and trade fewer shares and not have to worry as much about the surprise? So again, Paul, it's better the dancer, better the dancer, better the, um, what am I looking for? Better the devil, better the devil you know, okay, from the beginning. Now, that's just, that's just the way I like to do things, okay? It doesn't mean that you should too. If bonds implode, is the money rotating in the stocks? Not necessarily, okay? That's where it gets tricky, John, because if bonds go down, what happens? What do rates do, okay? If bonds go down, then rates go up, okay? Now, if bonds shoot up and you can get a 20% yield in bonds, let's say treasuries go to 20%. I know, slight exaggeration. But I remember double-digit treasuries, and I think some of you, I recognize some of you old farts in here. You're old enough to know, too. <laughs> Remember that too, but I remember specific. I think I remember like 11 percent uh, in bonds, maybe even higher. I remember I was talking to a radio station a couple of days ago on a uh, on a radio program, and uh, I remember back when they made a big deal about the prime rate. You don't, I don't think, that, I don't even know if prime rate still exists. But back when they would talk about the prime rate every night, I remember 21 percent prime rate. Now I wasn't trading in; I was a kid, but it could happen. But anyway, let's say you got a 20% bond. Well, I can make 20% of my money risk-free, so to speak. Okay, and there's always, there's always a caveat. Why would I put my money in the stock? So as bonds fall, rates go up. And at some point, as those rates go up, it will put pressure on stocks. Now, here is the problem. Mr. Murphy... John Murphy, wrote about intermarket technical analysis. It's a good book. You need to read it. It needs to be on your bookshelf. If I had to pick 12 books out of my shelf and throw away the rest, I doubt if I have a dozen on a worthwhile. But if I had to pick 12, I probably would keep that one for sure. Okay, and John Murphy's intermarket technical analysis, which is, which is a very good... I don't want to use the word academic, but it's a very good read in that it does teach you a lot about how markets are interrelated. 
But even Mr. Murphy says there are long lead and lag cycles, okay? So it's very difficult to trade directly off of that. And the best advice I could give you is intermarket technical analysis only matters when it matters. An example I use, about once every three or four years, I decide, oh, I'm going to go stick my head in one of these trading forums and there's a lot of numbskulls in, in most of these trading forums. Not all of them. There's some sites that are better than others. But there's one site in particular. I'm not going to say the name of it. But it's, it's for some reason, it, it's a harbinger for, how do I put it nicely? Uh, every word that comes to my mind is, is not uh, PG-13. But it's a harbinger for these, uh, let's call them DBs, you know? And they're just jerks. And they think they know it all. And they, like, they, just, they just sit around and like to rip each other, rip whoever comes into the forum a new one. Anyway, I digress. The point I'm trying to make is I was uh, they were talking about the S&P system or something. It's like, well, you know, take a look at bow ties if you want to go off a five-minute chart. I think it has merit. I have some clients that actually uh, uh, have experimented and do some things here and some people over the years that have fun with the five-minute chart and bow ties. And some guy rips me a new one. He gets through ripping me a new one. He says, all you have to do is watch the dollar. If the dollar goes up, you buy the S&P. If it goes down, you sell the S&P. Well, it just so happened that the correlation was working perfectly at the time. So in a market technical analysis, bonds versus stocks, stocks versus bonds, dollar versus gold, gold versus dollar, however you want to look at it, all that stuff matters when it matters, okay? Now, again, there are long lead and lag cycles. So it's important to learn about the intermarket relationships. But, you know, what's kind of weird is sometimes they're, they're just the opposite of what you might actually think longer term. So uh, do read the book. Do get that knowledge in your brain, okay? But be very careful trying to trade off of that knowledge, okay? Say the name. Say the name. No, it's not Seeking Alpha. Murphy is the Bible beside your book. Yeah, Murphy's a good guy. He's a good guy. Bonds were 17%, I think, in the early 80s. Yeah, I seem to remember like 11% or so when I was early in my trading career. So, yeah, 15%. Yeah, it was crazy. It was just absolutely crazy. Yeah, yeah, daily money, uh, Frank's saying that in 1980, at one point, the daily market rate on the Delaware cash reserve hit 13%. My father had some debt in his business, and that's why I know about interest rates, because as a kid, we put on the news every night as we ate dinner, it would ruin our dinner. And I remember when it hit 21%, my father turned white as a ghost. Thank God that was the end of it, <laughs> the end of the uh the uh, the rates, but uh, he was I guess he was a little leveraged at the time and didn't want to be leveraged in his business. Uh, he was in a cyclical type of business, and he turned kind of white when that happened. I'll never forget that. Um, that was kind of an interesting, interesting deal. Kind of had me. I, maybe that was part of my fascination with the markets. I mean, I always traded as a kid. Traded my lunch. Traded coins. Traded all kinds of things as a kid. My nickname was the trader because I was a picky eater in elementary school, and I would always be wheeling a deal and bringing cash. And I trade you my bun and some cash for your uh, <laughs> for your French fries. All right, 1981 point daily money market. Yeah, 13 percent. Yeah, that's a, that's 13 percent of money market. How ridiculous is that? Okay. All right, let's uh, finish up here so we get out to the uh, markets. Um. A lot of news lately fly, fly, uh, flying around, coming into the market. And you know me, I ignore all the news. I didn't even know there was a Fed meeting until I found out on the radio a couple days later while I was in the middle of an interview. And you need to ignore the stuff. As I wrote about it today's column, uh, Greg Morris, a good friend of mine, um, he's got a good book out now, by the way, Investing with the Trend. Um, I just picked up my – I was looking for some quotes in it this morning, in fact. Uh, my copy's all dog-eared up and everything already and marked up. Um, it's a little bit more complex book than I expected to come from Greg uh, because he, he does kind of keep things simple like I do. And I think that's why we probably hit it off, that and our, our affinity for a good beer. Um, but he's got a lot of little gems in there and a lot of little things, a lot of little um, – 
uh, just anecdotes and gems and all when it comes to the markets that make a lot of sense. And, and one thing he, he talks a lot about is how news is just noise. And if you ever uh, get a chance to see him speak, I'd recommend you do that. And he, he speaks quite often. Um, I think he's going to be at Vegas in October. I got a call from um, Metastock yesterday asking me if I was gone. And I'm like, are you asking me, if do you want me to go? Or are you asking me if I'm going to attend? So, But I digress. But anyway, um, Greg will often throw up a chart, about a 10-year chart, and there's no timeline in the chart, so it's hard to see what dates he's picked out. And I wish I had a list of everything he brought up because it, he makes a very compelling speech. But he said there were two wars in this chart. There were 20-something Fed meetings in this chart. There were um, 40 earnings announcements in this chart. And then he goes on and on. 9-11, um, you name it. All these things happen during this chart. And his point is... Can you tell me where those points are? And you can't because news is just noise. So uh, Ed Sakota was at a meeting recently. Um, actually, geez, was that back in March? Time flies. Um, if you guys don't know who Sakota is, you should. Um, you can read about him in, in the. I think he was in the first Market Wizards. And he's got a little uh, banjo song. Or a little um, whatever folk song or whatever called the the trend the whipsaw song. Google it or take a look on on YouTube for it. And he came to our meeting and he whipped out his banjo and he played the song and he made us sing along and it was kind of a lot of fun. And one thing I do remember is what do we do with a hot news flash? We stash that flash right into the trash. And here's the rest of these um, essential rules that he has. So I agree with Ed. It's like. Just ignore the news. It's just a lot of noise. And it will absolutely make you crazy if you try to follow the news. Um, this picture here, this is um, from his book, Garoppoli. He's got a book's kind of depressing. I, I haven't read it yet, but it seems like it's kind of depressing based on his speech that he gave after he did his little banjo song. But he talks about duckweed, and his point is that if it takes 39 days, if, let's just say duckweed doubles every day. Let's say you got a pond, okay? And after 39 days, the duckweed has covered up half of the pond. How many days will it take to cover up the rest of the pond? And the answer is one, okay? So tomorrow, this pond will be completely covered in duckweed because it grows that fast, okay? And that's his point in this Gavoperly book. Gavoperly, I hope I'm saying that right, is that we're in the 39th day according to this. Now, one thing good that he said, I, I try to find something positive in the negative, is one thing he said is there's going to be a lot of bubbles based on this, his Gavoperly theory. And that in, I think that's going to be a tremendous opportunity for us during these bubbles. And I'm going to keep an eye on these things. And as a trend trader, that should work out great. But here's his rules. If you go to Sakota.com, you can get his basic rules or just listen to his song on um, on YouTube. So uh, I think he said it the best. Uh, I could sit here and preach all day about news, but I like what Greg said. I like what Ed said. Um, what do you do with that news flash? You stick that flash into the trash, okay? All right, a couple of minutes, and then we'll hop into the charts. Um, check out my website. Store is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And just click on the uh, click on the store on the website for more on that. Again, flash drives, a lot of good stuff. Everything you see here we've covered so far this year up until June when I um, uh, for the first half of the year. And then right now I'm running a special until Monday. So if you get the stock selection webinar, you get a year to my trading service, and then you get the IPO webinar. If you add all that up, it's like um, three times the amount of just the course. So check that out if you get a chance. All right, I don't want to spend too much time on announcements. Let's get into the overall. Let's hop to the markets, and um, we could always come back to the slides if we need to. 
Um, you guys want to start asking about individual questions, you can start now. And then I'll, um, as soon as we get through with the charts, we'll get to them. Any questions, anything thus far also. First thing I want to do is let's take a look at the overall market. By the way, let's take a look at RAD first. Everybody's asked about RAD. Um, this is a situation where a stock makes all-time highs here, or not all-time highs, multi-year highs, I should say. And then you have a gap down the next day. That's reversal gap strategy. Okay, so an aggressive entry would have been right below this low. Um, by the time I put it in the service, I let it drop a little bit further and on this little pullback here. That was the actual setup. Okay. Now it's taken some time to unfold. Unfortunately, we're not back in that 1999 market where everything just moves up 50 points a day. Uh, we have to work at it a little bit more now. Okay. Now, let's take a look at the P's. Like I said, that we had a volatility move downward, hopefully, uh, or a low volatility fake out, I should say. Hopefully, that was a fake out. Uh, if we can hold here, we're at brand new highs. And then hopefully, and hate to use the word hope in this business, but hopefully, we'll continue to bang out some new highs. So, so far, so good. Ideally, you know me, I'd feel a lot better if we had cleared these prior highs decisively okay let's take a look at the nasdaq nasdaq as you know broke down out of this little range and sometimes you get a fake out and then a breakout okay write that down that's a good little pattern a little fake out then break out and we're not too too far from 14 year highs we're within eh, round numbers a quarter percent third percent maybe from 14 year plus highs Russell's a pain in the buttocks. It's just kind of meandering around. And this is one thing that I've been talking about, and specifically in the service, is that this is why this hasn't been the best year in the world for trends. It was pretty good earlier in the year. But it's been a little tougher every time in between, okay? And as you can see, it's just kind of wide and loose. Ideally, I like to see it break out the new highs and not look back. Okay, why? Hopefully, break down and pullback create a lot of setups to the downside. Uh, it would seem. Robert, I agree with you a thousand percent. Robert's saying, "Why are you hoping it's going to break out? Why, why not hope it rolls over?" Well, I was going to be a pessimist, but I figured it wouldn't work out. No, seriously, the reason is because it is a lot easier to make money on the long side than it is on the short side. Yeah, it's great on the short side when it works, like that rad overnight. That's that's fine. I'm I'm excited. Woo -hoo. You know, coming today and and, and um, a little bit of I would call it a windfall, but not a bad move overnight in that stock. But the short sides are kind of a pain in the butt. Talks. The retrace rallies are a real, real pain in the, in the butt. As I've said before, or I said earlier in this presentation, I've done quite a few presentations where I talk about the frustrations and aggravations on the short side. Much, 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 much easier to make money on the long side. But shorts are a necessary evil. And, yeah, give me give me uh, Gary Kalbaum once said, give me an uptrend, give me a downtrend, or give me a ticket to Tahiti. And I agree with Gary, absolutely. But it's much easier to make money on the long side, okay? But yeah, Robert, I hear you. I like the way you think, Robert. And here's the problem. You're on Robert's on my service. Ninety-nine percent of the other people, well, ninety-five percent. I'm getting this more in a bunch. Maybe it's more like sixty percent, but the majority of the other people, they don't think that way. And so if we do roll over, we start shorting, even if we begin printing money, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna lose clients. Because they're not going to take the short trades. They're not going to be willing to see both sides of the market. Now, it's okay if you don't take short trades, but you got to hang in there and wait and know that there will be some long trades, maybe just around the corner, and just sit back and, and wait for those. I understand there's some people who have some reason to guess why they, wouldn't short, they don't short. But I think that it's important to play both sides of the market. One of the reasons is, not because you're going to make a whole lot of money on the short side. I think we only made like 8 or 9% mechanically in 2009. Of course, on a relative basis, that's, that's, that's amazing. Um, you know, that's, that beats out about 95% of all money managers. But you're not going to get rich, or too rich, I should say, on the short side. But 
I think, if anything, the main thing it does is it helps you to see both sides of the market. And that's important. And not having an opinion up or down is incredible. And, the, and if you're able to play both sides of the market, then it really helps you to see both sides of the market. And it, and it, tempers, it tempers your bias tremendously. And it just makes you a better trader, a well-rounded trader. I'm not going to pick on anybody's long, long only, because I know, like some people running billions of dollars, have charters where you can't can't short. I understand that, but the problem that I do see with some of the people who are long only is that they're always looking on the bright side, and and I don't blame them, but I think it's important to see both sides of the market. So as a trader, we do need to see both sides of the market. Robert, you're 100% correct. Yeah. So what if it rolls over? But I'd rather it go up because it's a lot easier if it goes up, okay? Go short. Well, with buying put options, that way your, your risk is fixed. Yeah, it's fixed, but now you got decay. And now you got, now you're playing, you're playing time, you're playing, you're dealing with decay, you're playing volatility. I hear you, Don, but there's a lot of things that have to happen for you to make money on the short side with put options. And that's where – I'm not going to open up that can of worms uh, right now, but there's a lot that can happen. All right, let's take a look at what's going on in the sector. Let's talk about bonds first before I forget. I like the TLT. Um, We've had a pretty serious slide as of late. 119 to 113? What's the low here? Yeah, 113, no, 112 handle, okay? So you had a 119 handle, meaning it was a trading at 119 something and dropped to 112 something, okay? So that's seven points. That's a big drop for bonds, okay? That's a pretty significant deal. What I have observed... And like I wrote in today's column, I was part of a bond fund for over 10 years, the chief technical analyst. And what I learned at bonds is that a lot of people who are involved in the bond market are really bad traders. And I've seen that firsthand. I've seen it with, with mortgage brokers where they'll wait and wait and wait and wait and wait, thinking that rates are going to drop forever. And then all of a sudden rates start going up, and they all kind of rush for the door at the same time. And, and, and a lot of people in the bond market that have to do things, they don't care about trading. They just, their hand gets forced at times. I don't want to get into this because this was experienced over 10 years. It would be very hard to explain how it all works. But just trust me that the delta and rates are more important than the absolute level of rates, meaning the change in rates. So when you see a big change like this, okay, it could force some hands. Now, if it stabilizes here, we may have dodged a bullet, but if we start seeing some subsequent selling and it happens very quick, then a lot of people are going to be in a lot of trouble really fast. So we need to pay attention to this developing situation in bonds. Now, real estate, the REITs, they sure seem concerned about it, okay? And there's your non-volatile market making a an exceptional, making a 5% move over a couple days, okay, down. That's a huge move for a very low volatility type of market, okay? So these REITs look like they're in trouble. I, I can't get my head around whether or not I'm going to rush out and short them or not. Uh, they are lower in volatility, but can we get an expansion of volatility to make shorting worthwhile? I don't know. I'm going to take it on setup by setup basis. There are some out there that look like they could set up really soon and might be worth shorting. Let's take a look at the energies. Energies, I think, are worth shorting. Okay, And we have almost kind of a triple top here. What's beautiful about the energies is you got a bow tie here. I was talking about this at a service last night. It really didn't trigger, uh, with a liberal trigger, of course. Came back up, made all-time highs, or multi-year highs, I should say. Is it all-time highs? Close enough, okay, close enough. Almost all-time highs, or the mother of all. Would that be? That'd be the mother of all double tops. Let's take a look at that. Let's look at a quarterly chart. 
There you go. There's your there's your mother of all double tops. <laughs> Look at that. It's crazy. Um, and now we're getting a bow tie down. So I think that energies could provide some shorting opportunities and might be worthwhile going after. Um, I don't know if that's related at all to the interest rate situation. I would just trade it in and of itself. What's fascinating is we got plagues. And, you know, again, I get news through uh, osmosis. Uh, the president's sending 3,000 people over to Africa to fight Ebola, okay? Ebola <laughs> or Ebola, whatever. Um, interest rates skyrocketing. ISIS. Wars, Fed. Okay, that's that's all the news I know. And what are buy, what are what's gold doing? Nothing. <laughs> Yesterday I was actually down on the GLD. It was down what over a percent? Okay. And we're getting a little bit of a bounce today. Looks kind of like a dead cat bounce so far. Now you're thinking, well, Dave, gold's low. Maybe I should bottom fish, value fish, or whatever. Be a value buyer. Uh, and no, no, let it go. Let it go like the Frozen song. Just let it go, okay? And if it bottoms out and we begin to get a bow tie off the lows like we did a couple times this year or one time last year at least, then we start uh, buying some uh, some gold stocks, okay? But in the meantime, we just let it bottom out. And it's going to bottom out one day, and it's going to be the mother of all bottoms, but we need to wait for that bottom to occur. And obviously, at this point in time, it has become more of a process than an event. But the longer it goes sideways, the bigger the up move we're going to have. Okay? So that's what's going on in gold. Um, my only other thing I really wanted to talk about today in the sectors, and, and a lot of them are improving, like drugs. We're up here towards new highs. And you just saw banks, were, banks obviously, with today's action are coming back nicely in here. My only concern, though, is a lot of these sectors haven't really cleared their prior peaks just yet. In fact, you can just look at the S&P for that matter. It really hasn't cleared that prior peak decisively just yet. In fact, we can take a look at that. We've got time. You can see we're, we're getting there, but we're really not that far above this prior peak just yet. Well, a lot of areas like the semis are just kind of getting back to bumping up against those double tops. Okay, So ideally, I'd like to see those double tops cleared decisively. Back in the positive camp, you got areas like the transports, which actually made new highs uh, yesterday, and they're making new highs today so far. So as a general statement, things are looking pretty good. We've got a couple of areas that are getting hit, uh, especially like real estate and energies. But for the most part, things are hanging in there. A lot of areas at or near their prior highs, and again, we'd like to see those areas clear those prior highs decisively, okay, before getting too excited. But for the most part, they're hanging in there. All right. Let's uh, open it up. James wants to know about AKS. That's going to be a steel stock. Steel stocks have been taken off as of late, as you know, or as you may know. Um, this one just pulled back a little too much for my taste. And also... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. It's thirteen days in the pullback. That's just a little bit too many. Uh, if you're long and you survive that slide, then by all means um, stick with it. But I'm having a hard time getting excited about it. Nice job, Dave Pan W. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. S T uh, R A P A N W. Okay, Palo Alto. Uh, it's up towards new highs. That's a good thing. Um, it's a little wide and loose, but I hear you. It did break out. It's like an almost like a little tiny bit more pullback here. So I probably wouldn't go after it. Um, it may have made a momentum list of mine, though. I can't get that. There used to be a feature like Control M, and you could see what's in your momentum list. I'm about a week behind this Landry list updating it. Let's see if it's in there. Panda. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, see, I've got it in my momentum list, and it probably went in on this wide-range bar day here. Let me take a little report and see. I guess I need to hide the list because every week people just ask me every stock in the list. <laughs> 
No, let me hide that list. Pan W. Let's see when it went in, just for S and G's. Yeah, 11 days ago. Okay. And it's up 11% in 11 days. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Probably on this, well, I don't know what day I put it in. Probably on that day there. But ideally, I like a new high, not just a breakout before I put them in this list. But, yeah, it's, it's in the list. Uh, keep an eye on it. Keep it on your watch list. Um, I just thought we'd like a little bit deeper pullback. Okay. TSL for Bill. Uh, it's a solar stock, obviously. Well, I get, I get a lot of got a lot of questions last week about these mid-level setups. You can see it's kind of within this range between 18 and 12. For me to trade this stock, it would have to get above 18 for me to get excited about it. Um, I just don't like them when they're within a, a range like this. Okay, so I'd pass on that. Don wants to know about S&DK. I know what else he wants to know about. I'm going to save it for last. Maybe you won't ask about it. Um, yeah, there's nothing to do here, Don. Don, for, Don has never bothered to read my books yet, so I'm going to have to, I have to make him do that. Um, no, why would you ask about this? What, 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 what is this? It's nothing. <laughs> it gapped down, looked like it was in trouble. Now it's crawling its way back up. Um, yeah, there's no setup there. MBLY. MBLY looks good, Matt. Uh, my problem with that one is, and I almost actually put it in my trading service. reason I didn't put it in is that it, it, it's almost too extreme in the volatility, okay? Finally, something actually too extreme. It ran from 30 to 60 over a short period of time. That's a 100% move, short period of time. It's an IPO, so I'm a little bit more lenient with IPOs, but in order to trade this stock, you're going to have to have, you're going to have to have just such a wide berth. Um, for a change, it's actually almost too volatile for me. But, yeah, I think it has potential as a, as a good eye, Matt, as far as uh, following the methodology. At least Matt Matt read my book. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, Glob looks pretty good. Uh, but the problem with Glob is it came all the way back into its prior range, okay? I said it looked pretty good before I pulled up the chart, so take that back. It looks okay, but for me to get excited about it, it would actually have to make new highs and then pull back. So let's take that. Let's just wait on that one. CNX. Yeah, this one's kind of interesting. It's a, it's an aluminium stock. Uh, my only problem with it is it has. It's just going up three or four hundred percent already. It's still in my momentum list, and I'm just going to leave it in there. Okay, there it is, right there. You can see. But it's already going up three or four hundred percent, so I'm just probably going to leave it alone. Okay, two different hats that I wear. The momentum list is just something I track for fun. Uh, there's there's not actual trades that happen in it. Yeah, see, it's up eighty-two percent. It was put it in at fifteen, sixty-eight days ago. And see, from doing this list, I learn a lot. Six sixteen, two thousand six sixteen. So it's like it forces me to look at these stocks. And it made the list back here on 616. So it's it's going up 80% since it made the list. Okay. So at least it puts me, sometimes it puts me in the right stocks, but at least it, it wakes me up to what's going on. But it's had such an incredible run in here. Uh, I think it's a little dangerous, but it is on my Landry list today as a possible setup. But it's just very dangerous. So I'm going to say avoid it, but I think it has potential. Skeechers, or some people call them Skechers. Skechers is going to be a trend knockout. Yeah, it's going to be a pretty serious trend knockout. Um, I think if you're going to trade this one, you could trade it in a textbook kind of fashion. I doubt that it'll trigger, okay? But if it did, entry above the high, stop below the low. Okay, it's a little extreme trend knockout, but when you have something that's in a pretty good trend like this, you want to have a little bit more of extreme trend knockout, okay? So, yeah, I'll give you an okay on that one. Entry above the high. And then stop below the low. James, you're on the service. Don't keep asking about stocks that I've already mentioned in the service, if you don't mind. I'm not picking on you. I'm just saying let's uh, let's save those for the people who have um, who paid up. Apache, not bad. as a possible short. Uh, you got a bit of a triple top. I'm sorry, a uh, head and shoulders top working. And you've got a bow tie down. 
So, uh, you know, I said that bow tie down before even looking at it, believe it or not. I could just eyeball a chart and tell you whether, whether it's a bow tie or not. But you got a bow tie down, obviously, here. Uh, yeah, that looks pretty good, James. Good eye on that. NOV as a short. Uh, I like that last one better. What was that last one? Uh, Apache looks better, I think. Um, NOV is probably topped two. Okay. You'll probably see some shorts tonight and energies on the um, on the service. Yeah, that one looks like it's in trouble. I think the Apache looks a little better. X. Don, X is going straight up. Um, you got to wait for a pullback of that. In fact, that probably would pass. It's just gotten too extreme in here. CTL tree T. This was a um, kind of a, a buy at B type of setup, meaning that it passed through. You got A, B, C. It passed through B on its way higher. Uh, yeah, this one's on my radar. On a little bit more of a pullback, uh, I think it might be worth a shot. It's probably in my. Nope, it's not in the watch list. I'll be darned. But yeah, I've been I've been watching it because I look at all IPOs every night, and you should too. Andre, that's kind of a thin one. I actually, it's actually caught my eye, but it is, uh, it's thin, it's cheap, so I'd be careful with it. I hear what you're saying, though. If it, if it could continue to take off, maybe pull back. It's got a lot of bad memories in it. It's just a little too wild and crazy for trading, but I hear you. It's, it's caught my eye too. Camera on a stick. All right, GPRO. Um. I don't know. This is just such a stupid stock. It's it's I would it needs more of a pullback. If it pull back more, then I could say, okay, technically it might be worthwhile, but it needs to it needs more of a knockout move. ENPH. That's a solar stock. It's actually looking pretty good. Um, it's definitely trending. Oh, there it is right there in phase. Got to hide my list. Not that it's not that it's uh, proprietary. I'll give you a copy if you want it. But I just don't want everybody reading my list and having me, you know, it's like I want you to, I want to know what you're thinking about. Don't tell me what I'm already thinking about. Yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. That looks fantastic. Phil wants to know about SPCB. SPCB. Uh, yeah, there's another one of those trend, trend knockouts. Thin, kind of thin. Be careful. Super thin. But yeah, that's a pretty good trend. That's a pretty good looking trend knockout. Uh, entry above the high, stop below the low. You could probably go in in a textbook style and go after that one. Yeah, absolutely. But thin, really, really, really thin. So with that, with that thinness comes opportunity but also comes risk okay you got to be really careful trading those thinner stocks you can do it as a private trader and, and sometimes we go after some really thin ipos but just be careful uh i don't like this stock because it's made almost 100 percent retrace from its breakout so there's nothing to do with that one i don't know who asked about that but um whoever asked about that one no gbx yeah, I mean, it's making new high. It's a railroad. It's kind of hard for me to get excited about a railroad. It's already kind of ran. I think it's already ran its course. Um, it's a railroad, okay? They're not going to split the atom. They're not going to come out tomorrow and say, we've got, a, we've got a faster train that runs above the tracks. It just floats around, and um, we're, our shipping rates are going to go down by 98%, um, and we're going to be the only railroad in the world, and it goes up. The stock's going to go up $1,000. Uh, probably not going to happen. It's probably ran its course. This is the case we talked about the big caps earlier, and my point was that, hey, Micron ran up 300%. Well, we actually look at a short Micron now, okay? But the point is that, yeah, these big cap stocks could run up 300%, but at some point they're going to be priced for perfection, okay? I don't know a lot about the railroad business, but I guarantee you, uh, but I'm, I'm going to guess. I don't guarantee you. I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess that diesel fuel has something to do with the railroad business. I'm going to guess because that you burn diesel fuel to run the electric engine that pulls the train. Okay. 
Um, you probably have some other fixed costs in there. I guess that's a variable cost. But it's not rocket science. I bet if I did a little studying, I could probably have some quantifiable fundamentals when it comes to the railroad business, okay? And go back and watch Stock Selection webinar. In that, the more quantifiable fundamentals that you have, meaning the more that you could get that calculator and spreadsheet out and figure things out like cost of diesel and all these other things, not that I'm becoming a fundamentalist on these efficient issues, but fundamentals are probably more important to a stock like a railroad. So when they get this high and have tr trended that long, then fundamentals can actually come into play, meaning that they are priced for perfection. Um, but they still can make wonderful shorting opportunities when that occurs. Okay. Greenbrier makes real cars, not a railroad per se. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. That's even better. Okay, they make railroad cars. Well, how much does it cost to make a railroad car? Uh, what's the price of steel doing um, that you're still going to have some energy costs in the manufacturing of that? Not that you want to sit there and add up all these things and figure it all out, but it's easier to do it in something like Greenbrier than it is in in-phase solar stock, okay? Um, big difference between those two stocks. I recently got burnt shorting GBX at 63. Well, yeah, you probably want to wait for a pretty serious bona fide sell signal. Um, I don't see where you would have had a sell signal at 63. Um, and here's the thing, perfect hindsight, of course. Where you see a big gap like this at brand new highs, you probably want to think long and hard about shorting that stock, okay? Until that gap is completely closed and then some, okay? Is the setup good though? No, you gotta wait for a pullback. Bill. Uh yeah, we wait for we trade pullbacks, okay? Read layman's. Don's here and he won't go home until I talk about Ford. Uh Ford looks like it's in trouble. I'd be willing to bet it's probably bow tied down. Yeah, sort of. Ford it's just wide and loose, at least in more recent times. Uh, I think it's in trouble, and for me to do anything with it, again, it would have to either drop below 15 or get above 18. I'm going to keep saying that. As long as it stays between 15 and 18, I'm going to say that. ETAC? Uh, no. I'm getting the sense that Andre likes to trade these little, thin, cheap stocks. <laughs> it would have to break out above this wide and loose range here, and then it's going to have a whole bunch of trouble. But, Dave, that's a 50% move. Yeah, but still, it's not worth it. Okay. NFX is a short for Mr. James. Um, well, it's at... It's at somewhat lower levels. I'd prefer to short something like way up here as opposed to shorting it at uh, somewhat lower levels. Um, I hear you. The pattern is there. The pattern is definitely there. If all I was seeing was this chart right here, I would say go for it, okay? you got a double bow tie, which we talked about earlier, which I think is a powerful pattern. Um, I'm going to give you a not bad on that one. I'm going to personally pass because... It's kind of mid-range, but hey, if it runs, if it goes back to its old lows, 25, that's still a pretty good trade, okay? So as a trade, yeah, um, it's trying to catch the mother of all tops or or the or, or at least a, a, a pretty big picture top. I'm not as excited about it. I'm more excited about going something like this rad, which could go could probably drop down, which has the potential to maybe drop down to two bucks a share. Then I am. Something like the Netflix, which can maybe drop 10 points or so, and that's probably going to be it, okay? But, yeah, absolutely, good eye on that one. I mean, you know, stop short of giving you a high five. If, it, if we didn't have longer-term problems, you can get a high five on that one. Well, let's see. It's going to get cold out soon, so uh, let's buy a Coke company. Well, unfortunately, that logic doesn't normally work, but looks like this stock is headed higher. Uh, maybe on a pullback, it might be worth a shot. Uh, who knows? Uh, let's, uh, one or two more, and we have to wrap things up. Simo, Simo, 
You say Simo, I say Simo. Let's call the whole thing off. Uh, no, because this caught my eye a while back, but notice where it closed here. Notice where it closed here. So that's like a month now, two months of sideways trading. So I would leave it alone. If anything, unless you're thinking about a short, then yeah, I think it could be a trouble on the short side. It looks a little dangerous. But yeah, shorting is what you're thinking, Phil? Yeah, all right, Phil. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you that. You're a little bit of a pioneer. Could be a little dangerous, but I hear you. I think you got I think you're onto something. I, I, I yeah. I'll stop short of giving you a high five, but yeah, that's that looks like it's in trouble. I agree with you, Phil. Phil's got a pretty good eye, by the way. Well, look, we're like uh, after the time that where the recording gets a little difficult to process, so let's go ahead and wrap things up. Oh, thank you, John. John says, thanks for another great show. Appreciate it, John. Have a good weekend. Yeah, you too. Uh, I'm humbled by your appearance. Thank you for showing up. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here, so uh, high five to you on that if you didn't get a high five for your stock pick. Uh, if we don't talk again, everybody have a fantastic weekend, and hopefully I'll see all you guys again next week. Thank you so much. Best yet. Wow, thank you so much. <laughs> Appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome, Leon. <laughs>